Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show. We're doing this again. Me and Alan reviewed the album The Magic Project by Bruce Dickinson, but I thought, you know what? We need to get a global picture to truly understand the magnitude of what this album's all about. Is it as good as everyone says it is, or is it not so good as everyone says? Tanvir all the way in London, thank you for joining us. K-Man all the way in Scotland, and Perrin just north of me. Guys, we're talking about The Magic Project that's going to be released on March the 1st. And this is 18 years since Bruce Dickens' last studio album. It was produced by guitarist Roy Z. This is what we're going to do, guys. We're going to go round table, track by track, very quickly. Just give us your impressions, any feedback, any remarks of each song that you heard, you like, you didn't like. We'll go through it that way. And then at the end, we can sort of get some closing remarks like the lawyers do. Guys? Okay, man, I know you're all the way in Scotland. I'm going to let you start off. I guess this is what we'll do. We already heard uh, Afterglow of Ragnarok, and we also heard um, Rain, on Rain on the Graves. Just quickly summarize to me those two first singles. I know we've also, all of us have talked about these songs in great length, but quick overview of those. Is how do they hold up today? I think right? they, they are uh, songs that, that kind of, they, they don't give away too much, you know what I mean? They're kind of safe songs to put out as singles to kind of say this album is new and it is different, but I think they're, they're solid, but they're okay. nothing too exciting. And I think for me, I was expecting a bit more of a pizzazz being that it's been 18 years since Tyranny of Souls, uh, that album really started with a bang and Abduction was a huge single when it came out in terms of the force and the sound and the the impact of that song. All right. as a... Tanvir, what'd you, were these first two singles representative of the album now that you've heard the whole thing? It, I wouldn't say they're representative of the album, but I, I, I did think they were, it was musical theatre. I, I mean, I, I, I thought they were robust. They were bright. The production was really clear. Um, I felt they were really catchy. It, I thought it was dramatic. Um, I, I thought it was, uh, Bruce's enunciation was superb. Um, so, so I, I, you know, I, I, I thought it was more accessible. Um I thought it was, uh, but it but it was still heavy. Um, perhaps, uh, as I say, cleaner in sound, so less murky. You can hear all of the instruments. Cush's, Bruce's vocals right to the foreground. Um, uh, and I thought it was exciting, actually. I thought I thought, thought it was right. really full of personality. All right, Perrin, were they were the first two singles a good choice? to release as the first singles and we're not we're not going to start talking about the whole album but do you think for yourself personally these were two good representations and good choices for the first two singles i would say yes and no so actually i would say no and yes so my expectations were here i mean 18 years since three amazing albums in a row Jimmy, when you and I were at Bruce's speaking engagement here in Montreal he spoke to the fact that he was leaving Canada and flying right to Los Angeles to work with Roy Z on this album. So we were all kind of like, wow, it's really happening. My anticipation level was through the roof. And when I heard Afterglow, I was kind of like, okay, Bruce is in fine voice. Uh, The riff, the guitar work is great, but the song just kind of let me flat a little bit, especially the chorus. I just felt it was, you know, I, I kind of liked where it was headed, but then it kind of fell flat for me. So Afterglow was kind of a disappointment. And then Rain on the Graves, I have to digest a bit. And I've said this before to people, this album, it is representative of the album because a lot of this album does need to be taken in and digested. At first, Rain on the Graves, again, I liked the song. I liked the chorus a lot better than Afterglow. But this almost spoken word voices, I wasn't so sure about it. But then when I kind of grew with it a little bit, heard the rest of the album, Rain on the Graves made a lot more sense to me uh, once I heard everything. So, right. and I actually quite enjoy it now, but I, Afterglow for me is 
I wouldn't say one of the weaker songs on the album, but it's in my lower half of the album. Oof. Whereas Rain on the Grave Oof. is in the Oof. top. Well, not for me. Now, hey, it's a good album. We'll get that as soon. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'm like, just, well, I'm just kind of. Look, I'll, I'll tell you. After look, it's, look TV, again. I'm going to say this like I always say this. It's a subjective, and it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, if you like it or don't like it. The question is, we're expressing our opinions about it. But I'm just yeah. kind of like taking back. I'll, I think I'll, I'll end this probably. segment with this, Jimmy. I had Afterglow ranked as my number seven track out of ten. Okay. Wow. I had Rain on the Graves ranked as number four out of ten. Wow. Really. Jeez. I, I, right. For me, I felt they were guys, the obvious singles, I have to say. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with you, Tanvir. To me, yeah. these first two singles were representative because the first one was dramatic and big, right? Grandose. Yeah. And then the second one was kind of quirky and diverse. So it kind of it gave you a sense of the whole album as one, you know, and that's what the album to me represents. The obvious singles doesn't mean they're the best songs. Perhaps no, they no, are the no, obvious no. singles. I yeah, think- yeah. As I say, I, I don't think that they're bad songs or anything. I think my expectations Agreed. were just so high. And uh, Tyranny of Souls is such a good, uh, it's a really kind of modern album for Bruce as well. So I was expecting this album to be more modern, to be more cr- progressive, more uh, exciting. And I don't think Afterglow or Rain on the Graves really does that in the same mm. way that some of the songs on Tyranny of Souls do. K-Man, K- there is a stinker on this album. But okay, okay. We'll, come we'll, to we'll, we'll, we'll get to, to that. We'll come yeah. to that. Tanvir. I think okay. we'll even agree. Or Many I Doors agree. to Hell. You know, for me, this was the Deep Purple track of the album. What did you think of Many Doors to Hell? Uh, are you, oh, right. Yes, um, you, you, I, sir. This, yes, you, sir. Oh, right, okay. I thought it was, uh, and I, I know parents mentioned this as well, in terms of this being um, almost ghost-like. Um and I agree with them, actually. It's very catchy. It's almost pop, um, very anthemic. The drum sound um, was reminiscent of something like Shout at the Devil or Creatures of the Night. They sounded well, really, really, really quite massive. Rocky um, like a hurricane. It's got that rocky like a hurricane snare to it. Right, right, yeah. I mean, it was, it, 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 it sort of, as I say, it had that sort of bombastic feel to it. I love the use of the guitar solo on this track because the track itself is a mid-paced rocker, but the guitar solo sort of pulls back the track, slows it right down, and then you have this beautiful phrasing. And then there is this sort of theme within the within the album where you have beautiful guitar phrasing that's partnered, not conflicted with Bruce's vocals, and they sort of entwine with each mm-hmm. other. And right. um, it, it's a really good partnership. It works really, really well. So right. it, I wasn't bowled over when I first heard this, I have to say, but it's really grown on me on the third listen. And now it's one of the, it's definitely one of those tracks that grows with every listen. Good. Came in. Uh, l- l- let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about this rock you like a hurricane vibe yeah, on this song. That <laughs> snare, the shum. Yeah. Shum effect that- on the snare. Everything. You're right, Kate. That's that's what it would that that. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. So so tell me about the song, the, came in. Tell me about it. Of the Cure, like parents say, Ghost, and I guess Ghost is like the the modern uh, equivalent. But it really reminds me of like disco, kind of gothic disco pop song, you know, which is totally different than anything Bruce has ever done before. Except there's a song on Turning of Souls called Devil on a Hog. And it's kind of similar. It's got that same kind of groove, swagger to it. I like it a lot. All right, good, good, good. Perrin? Yeah, and and I've said in our circle of friends, I mean, I'm our resident ghost fan uh, here on the panel. And when I heard it, when I heard that keyboard line at the beginning, I'm hearing ghosts dance macabre. Even a little bit of Mary on a Cross, which was a big hit for them. And again, I don't think Bruce did these things on purpose. I don't think he said let's do something that sounds like ghost or you know american 1980s hair metal or the scorpions i think it just came out that way and the gentlemen have both said it very well if there's a song that really ticks my 80s pop sensibilities box on this album it's this one and this could have been a single just because singles are usually shorter and simpler and easier to digest and and again so this has been in my top three songs since the beginning uh 
it's not necessarily representative of the whole album, so maybe that's why it's not a single, because I don't think there's anything this accessible on the album. Uh, and I agree with the guitar. Like, one of the notes I had taken when I first heard it, I, I wrote down beautiful, atmospheric guitar solo. And this is, this this is, is not a ripping, song. shredding guitar solo. It's adding ambiance and atmosphere yeah. to yeah. the song to make, it, to make it more accessible. And, and the, I say a keyboard line, but there's some organ in here, I think, as well. So uh, the, the use of keys in the song is really, really excellent. It so, gives it that, that flavor of Deep Purple, that little organ sound right in, lurking in the background there. No. That's what I felt about Rain on the Graves as well. There's a deep purple song. Uh, yeah, I think that, that yeah, that, that one to me actually is more deep purple than this one. I think this is more contemporary. Um, uh, one interesting point actually is that the first two tracks of the album were mm -hmm. actually written last year. Bruce has right. said that. So okay. th the, the first two tracks are actually the newest tracks I think or, or the newest yeah. songs of the album. Let, let, let's mosey on down to a resurrection men now here here is now we're we're talking about you know flamenco we're talking about upbeat we're talking about time changes Perrin, what'd you think about a resurrection men if i was going to give an award for the song that's the most musical on the album maybe maybe it's this one because like you said there's that intro which is you know again we can't help but think of Bruce as the singer of Iron Maiden. So I love that he's giving us something that's different from Iron Maiden. Mm -hmm. So I listen to this song and there's the flamenco intro, which is just fantastic. Uh, and then in the middle, the time change is just so interesting. And then we go into this like sludgy Tony Iommi kind of style riff that, you know, this is a song for me. When I first heard it, I'm not sure how high up my list it was. And with every listen of this record, it moves up my list. Now, there's just there's a lot happening in this song. It's all excellent. I wasn't sure about how it all came together because the time change was pretty abrupt. And then it's almost like we go into a, a whole different song. But they're both great. So yeah, yeah. A, a very musical song for the musos in our audience. Uh, this is the one they might want to kind of unpack the most and kind of run to because it, it really is... Uh, quite diverse musically and very interesting. Cayman, other than what Perrin just said, what else could you add to that? Uh, it remind, the intro really reminds me of the kind of stuff Roisey was doing on Balls to Picasso. It's got that kind of Latin feel to it. I don't really know how well the Spaghetti Western intro actually works with the song. Uh, it does feel like an idea that they've done it and then the song kind of kicks in. Also, this song, Resurrection Men, is probably the most related to the idea of Magic Project and Lazarus and Raising the Dead. And I thought the album was going to be based on this heavily, but this song and maybe a few other moments across the album is the only really the times it gets mentioned. All right. So all I right. thought that was interesting. Okay, man. Uh, sorry, uh, Tanvir. Uh, what do you think about the song that these guys haven't actually said about it? I, uh, I thought this was like a music box, a, a toy box for Bruce, because I, 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 I'm not sure about the Latin flamenco. For me, it had more of a cinematic perception or Spaghetti a Western. Of, of Spaghetti a Western, Western style. But <laughs> thrown in with that, what I th thought was really interesting was this sort of 60s John Barry swing that kicks in as well. So it wasn't just, it was, it was, it was a very, it, I thought this was the, this is perhaps the most playful track on the album because it's not just the Western intro. If you listen, it, that combines with the John Barry late sixties, you know, very sort of quintessential British swing. And then, and then it goes into this Sabbath homage Blues with a, with the I own, Iomi riffing, but also this a very fat sounding bass as well, geezer, sort of geezer yeah. bass that kicks in. And I mean, you look at all of these different elements and you think, how does it come together? And for me, it's Bruce actually. Bruce's voice almost holds all these disjointed forms together, and that sort of acts as the the constant central theme in the song. So yeah, a really fun, playful track. Thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, 
Um, yeah, it does make you smile. Good, good. Fingers in the wounds, K Man. I love it. Now, now we're getting symphonic here, right? I now Bruce it. is dabbling in the symphonies. Um, yeah, that key, the keys on it, it's, it's so, it's almost like a, a vo- ship voyage or something that the intro of that song is, it's really nice. And, you know, he's, he's going full concept, full religion, s- symbolism, and uh, Jesus and all this stuff, modern, modern day Jesus. But uh, the first time I heard it, again, I was really shocked because it doesn't sound like anything he's ever done before. It's very, like, power metal. And you've, I don't think you've ever heard Bruce do anything like it before, but I love it. I think it's some of the best lyrics on the album. Yeah, great. I mean, you got you got a groove, a slide guitar, Arabic, uh, Arabic uh, sort of scales. Perrin, what do you think about this song? Uh, this is my favorite song on the record. I think it's been my favorite song on the record since I heard it. I can't believe how much this song gets done in under four minutes. It's actually yeah. incredible what yeah. this song gets done uh, in in under four minutes. And it should be a lesson in brevity to, to every any musician out there. This should be a lesson in brevity and how much you can accomplish in four minutes if you do it right. I agree with K-Man that the, the keys and piano in this are beautiful. Uh, Bruce's voice is soaring in this song. Uh, I don't know if it's sitar, Middle Eastern, Indian vibe that we kind of segued to in, into the song, but I think that's beautiful. And uh, I, I think this could become an epic. This this is a song that I close my eyes and it's taking me on a voyage. I can just close out the world. To the clouds. Mm-hmm. No, I can really. <laughs> you know what? This one Sailing. isn't that difficult to listen. It's so yes. pleasant to listen, though. Yes. That you can put on headphones, close your eyes, and it takes you to another place. So this Agreed. is far and away my favorite song on the record. Tanvir, what do you want to add to everything that these guys have already said? Yeah, you want I mean, to you want to take a trip to Montreal. That's what you're going to say. <laughs> you want to go by ship, but you want to go by ship. Well, one <laughs> thing I would say. One thing I will say is the orchestration is is um, tastefully done. It really complements the song, and I've heard so many power metal bands use orchestration in their intros and it's and it's and it's not it's not subtle it's not tasteful it's almost abrupt and it's almost um immature Mm -hmm. um and 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 this was this was beautifully done um and you're right it's got these far eastern motifs and it's got um, tabla drums, what sound like tabla drums. I don't know whether they are. So there are all these kinds of imagery. Um, are they authentic sounding? Um, no, but I don't think that's the point. I, I, I think this is fun. Um, I think it's music theatre. It's over the top. Um, and it works because it's executed so well. It, it, it works really well. Okay. Yeah. Now, here, here's an interesting one. I'm going to get came in to comment. Eternity has failed. I know I've talked about this on the other review. Uh, Eternity has failed, which is sort of the cover song of Eternity Should Fail, if Eternity Should Fail, which was actually a cover song of Eternity Has Failed. Yeah. So originally written by Bruce and Roy Z to be on the solo album, they change it up for the Iron Maiden album, and then they change that up again to appear on this solo album. Yeah. So... There is some differences there. I'm going to ask Cayman right now. Cayman, what do you notice as the differences? I hear the difference. They they cut away the verses, you know, but what did you notice? What did you like? Which one did you like better? How's that? That's a better question. Do you like the Maiden version or do you like this version better? Well, the, the, the main thing about this song is this song was meant to be the centerpiece around Bruce's whole concept and the album. Like the album was supposed to be called If Eternity Should Fail, the whole story was started and formed around this song. And so Maiden, Steve needed a song and Bruce gave it to Steve and then regretted it. Uh, You know, uh, it's it's one of the strongest Maiden openers in a long time. And now it's existed as a Maiden song for the, the past five years. And Bruce was like, well, wait a minute, I want my song back. I really love that song. So then he's obviously decided that he doesn't want to just change it a little bit and have it be 
just another version of Maiden's song, which is actually his song. So he's kind of sequelized it and called it uh, Eternity Has Failed. And part of me finds it interesting. He's added the flute and he's slowed it down. He's made it a bit more uh, grungier. Um, I love the lyrics. I think it's very smart that he's he's sequelized his song and he's kind of closed it off a little bit. But I just wish that if he was going to sequelize it, he could have written a whole new song and Maiden, the Maiden song could still exist which, uh, and this song would could be a successor and it doesn't quite do what it wants to do. Or, or you you believe it does, like in your opinion, yeah. you like the Maiden course, song better. Opinion, yeah. Yeah, that's it. okay. uh, right. It's got kind of both feet in either camp. Like everyone will know it's a Maiden song because it's, it's existed for the past five years as a Maiden song and he's tweaked it enough to make it his song, still his song, but it's always mm-hmm. been his song. But I, I like it. I like the changes. I like the fact that he's, he's been... But, but here, the it. original question, yes or no, do you like the Maiden song better? I like, than I like Bo- the Maiden song better. All right, all right. Perrin, let's go. Um, do you prefer this song over the Maiden version or vice versa? I, I think I like this better, but the question's a little unfair because I've lived with the Maiden song for so long. Yep. The and question is, is like not unfair. It's very, but, it's okay, extremely it is, Jimmy, unfair. It is, Jimmy. It's hard, it's an it's hard right. to answer because I've lived with the Maiden song for a long time. I've experienced it live as an opener of the show. And this is like a shiny new toy. So I I like what Bruce has done with it. I, I find it more musical. I like some of the nuance that he put into it. You know, ask me the same question in a year or two and my answer might be different. And, you know, maybe I read too much into this, right? But I, I see this song included on the album, and I'm like, did, did he want to sequelize it, and that's why he did it, and it fit in with the concept? Or was it like he wants to say to Steve, you see, this is how it's supposed to be done? So it just got my mind going, because I haven't really sat there lyric versus lyric and, and compared I them did. that closely. But I just kind of wondered, hmm, is this indicative of any kind of a political dynamic that exists in Maiden? which is why he did it. So the conspiracy theorist in me is kind of this mm-hmm. like, why do this? Why do this? But I do like the result quite a bit. I do like the result quite a bit. And it's in my top three on the record. I, I really do, right. do like it. Tanvir, what are your thoughts on this? Yay or nay? Is that how I, they say it in the UK? Yay or nay? Is that how they say I, it? I, I will be a politician here, Jimmy, and I won't answer the question. But I will go on <laughs> to a... Um, go on to a, 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 a divert, so to speak. Um, look, I uh, I don't understand why any bands do sequels to songs. You know, when Megadeth did it with Return to Hangar 18, when Metallica did it with that Unforgiven 2, I find they never work. Um, so I, I'm not a massive fan of that. And I'm sort of gl- I'm glad Bruce sort of stuck to his guns on this and did this version. Um when you first when you first hear it, it is rather you, it, it is odd. You, you're you're constantly reminded of um, the opening to Book of Souls, and because that's a great track uh, and the rest of it. But I find the more I've listened to the album, the more I've actually appreciated this song for what it is. Um, and and you know, once again, it's it's. Um, it's you know it's a it, it's a brave new world this song and what I mean by that is that you've got all these sort of woodwind instruments you've got the a beautiful use of the flute at the beginning of the song but you get this great flourish um, at the end and you're thinking maybe that's a, a bit of a nod for Bruce to uh, Jethro Tull um, <laughs> and then you've got this maiden midsection. And rather than having two dueling guitars, once again, you have the repetition of the guitar working in harmony, not in um, okay. not in uh, conflict with the keyboards. Um, and and you have this sort of musical crescendo at the end as well. Um, it, it, it's very intricate. It's got a lot of moving parts to it. Um, in some parts, it's quite dainty. Um, and it's quite, it's very progressive, um, which the Maiden song isn't. Um, 
And this version version is no less. I still love the Maiden version. You know, it, 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 it's a great version. And, and there, Bruce is part of the band, whereas in this track, Bruce is very much pushed to the forefront. And I yeah. and as I say, I've, I've listened to this track now four times. At first, I was very lukewarm, and every time I hear it, I get more and more, uh, more and more into it. You know. Yeah, yeah. So I think you. It's fair to say that Tanvir likes this song better than the Maiden version, right? You like no, I did song not better? say that. Well, what did you say? I don't know how you say. I heard crescendo, <laughs> and I heard this and that. <laughs> did, did I say that? Well, I tell me, tell me, yay that. or nay? Yay or nay? What is it? There is, and not everything is like binary, better? Jimmy. The world is a complex mm. place. But on this show, it's not. It's easy. It's <laughs> easy peasy. Okay. <laughs> Listen, awesome. tell me, yes or no? Do you like the Maiden version better than the Bruce version, or vice versa? Sorry, Jimmy. The sound. I can't hear you that clearly. Brad, okay. Sorry. Maybe Do you, you like the, the Bruce? Not too great. <laughs> Just tell me. Answer the question. <laughs> Answer the question. Which one do I prefer? Um, yes. At the moment. Oh. The maiden version, okay. As I say, at the, but that that no could buts. change. That could change. That could change in in two weeks. Aaron, quickly, quickly. Mm, maiden version or the Bruce version? I I already stated I like this version better. I like okay, the but because he, but Tavir just got me so mixed up. I didn't remember. <laughs> you should have left him alone because we had. <laughs> I like Bruce. K Man likes Maiden. Defendably, both of all us. All right, all right. So I'm I'm book. with the Tanvir Perrin gang on this. I no, sorry. Did you say you like Maiden's version better, Tanvir? No, he said today, but like maybe Bruce not better. today, but later on. I, I, like like no, I said I said at this present moment the ma the the Maiden version. Okay, I so prefer. so K Man and Tanvir are the Maiden side. Of things and me and Perrin are more on the Bruce side of things. I, 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 I think they've, they've, they've. This is the way the song should have been. I think, I think this version works for this album. Yeah, and I think that's. Yeah, that, that, that still doesn't answer my question. But, but I know what you're saying. You prefer the Maiden version today more than the Bruce. I prefer the Bruce version more than the Maiden version. But yes. let's leave it at that. Let's leave it at that. It's a two-two tie. Okay, we're not gonna. We're not going to convince. I see the UK no, is against Canada here. That's what I'm no, saying. That, 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 yeah. my, my point is, there's no competition. We, we need to take this to the king to just to settle the dispute. <laughs> needs to go to the royal family, I think. He, right. he specifically written the song as a sequel so as to not compare the two. You know? No, I get that. I get that. But there's still, you know, the melody's the same. The, the, everything's the same. I mean, you know, it's pretty much the same minus a few verses yes. and a couple of changes on the chorus and yep. the words. But okay. more or less, it's the same song. But is, let's, the, let's... is the king working this week, or is he taking? I know he had to take a medical leave. Perrin, so. Perrin, you're you're mentioning the king to a Scotsman, and I to he doesn't with, like that. He doesn't. I like honestly that. didn't realize who he was talking about. <laughs> and, 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 your and king, not your in, king, but your with, king. With Indian descent, king so uh, yeah. but, you know. <laughs> He's the king. Well, apparently, well. apparently he's the our king too. Yeah, it's our king too, but not really. But anyway, my king, mistress. Of Mercy. I love it. Probably the heaviest track on the album. Tanvir, what would you think of Mistress of Mercy? I, I, I really enjoyed this track. I mean, mm -hmm. this, is, this for me is one of the stronger tracks on the album. Though I surprised myself with that because yeah. it sort of starts with this sort of supercharger, Rob Zombie, supercharger heaven sort of riff, um, which, which is slightly odd. Um, but it sort of juxtaposed with this euphoric chorus. There is this beautiful anthemic euphoric chorus in this song that elevates, that is a great contrast to that very bass, almost industrial riff that it starts with. And then there is, and then there is this sort of, the, the, it sort of cuts in with this um, guitar riff, which is almost commercially sort of maiden commercially sounding very sort of late 80s it could have been it for some reason it reminded me of something that could have been from somewhere in time um in in terms of the sound and the tone on that so it, it, it's that sort of late very late uh 80s um maiden guitar sound and then you have this extravagant um musical drum orgasm at the end, oh, oh, nice. which is um, <laughs> that it climaxes to, which, are, which which is great fun as well. I mean, it's sort of 
Um, it, it's slightly showy, but it works for the song. It sort of builds up, right, builds right. up, and builds up these rolling drums, and it sort of, you know, you, you've got that flourish at the end. So, you, so it, yeah, it, I, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this track. You know, what you got is that build up, is that sort of fusion guitar, the jazz yeah, fusion so, guitar, and the drums in the midsection and the outro. So, Perrin, what do you very think? Very progressive, Jimmy, this album. A, a lot very. of you know, a lot of stuff in here. Fusion, so, fusion, jazz. So, you know, often on a record, and maybe this happens with a lot of us, have you ever been in a situation where all of your friends love a song and you're just having a hard time with it? And, and that's me with this song. Like, for whatever reason, all of the people I know who've heard the album are really kind of pointing to this song as one of the highlights. And I'm, I'm just not there yet. And the funny thing is, it has a lot of ingredients that I like. You know, I... It's not the kind of the grungy kind of intro because I don't mind that. For I, I, I kind of feel like this song has a bit of an accident of birth vibe and I love that record. And I even wrote down John Bush era Anthrax. I feel like there's a point in this song that it has that only industrial feel. So, but for whatever reason, I'm a big chorus. So I like big choruses. I like Accident of Birth. I like John Bush singing Anthrax. I don't mind a grungy opening. It has all these ingredients that I like, but the cake didn't come out the way I want the cake to come out. So I, I don't know why. Same. I just, I'm, I'm not there yet. You know, I'm not there yet. So everyone I know cites this as one of the highlights of the album. It's not one of the highlights for me. I suspect the more I listen to the record, I'm probably like eight or 10 lessons in and eventually I'll be 20 and 30 that this will grow on me. But this yeah. one's going to have to grow on me for whatever reason. All right. It's not resonating with me as much as some of the others. Okay, man. Would you say that this is the closest thing to Bruce Dickinson and Samson? Very um, um, Samson. Yeah, you know, it, it's straight ahead, rocky. You know, it's got that. I would say this is the most conventionally Bruce Dickinson song on the album. This should have been the lead single because it, it has all the elements of what you would expect. From a Bruce Dickinson song. Uh, it reminds me of Freak off the uh, Accident and Buff. It's got that mistress. The, the title's rubbish, by the way. You should have called it something else. Um, but it reminds me of Freak and it reminds me of Head Switch off of Skunk Works. It's got that kind of grungy, kind of ballsy in your face thing. Like Tandria said, the be- just such an amazing chorus, probably the best chorus on the album. And that's saying a lot, considering all the choruses are really good. Well, that, that's why I said Samson, right? Because Samson had those sort of melodic choruses, right? Right. And, and, and if you and listen to, to think angel. about it, listen to the song again, then think about Samson and the kind of choruses they had in that band. Very straightforward and, you know, catchy, yeah. melodic. What Tanvir said about the guitar sound, having that kind of summer in time style it does. But it also reminds me of uh, The Man That Would Be King, that whole jam set section off of Final Frontier. It's got that kind of vibe to it. Uh, mm-hmm. I really like it. I think if they put this out as the lead single, I would have shouted from the hills that this was going to be the, the best Bruce Dickinson album ever because it's just, it makes such a statement. I think hit the chorus, is, he, he sings his ass off in the chorus and I really hope they do it live. But the title, he should have came up with a better title, a more unique title than, than that because we already have Mother of Mercy we've, you know what I mean where's your mistress it kind of ties back into Freak but I just feel like it, it deserves a better title than it's got Face in the Mirror alright now I I hear a lot of buzz on the internet about this song Some it's very polarizing a lot of people like it a lot of people fall asleep to it Tanvir are you one of those sleepers it, look, this is the ballad, I mean, uh, and it's not a good one. Um, and I, I'm not sure whether that's because of the song itself. I mean, it, for me, uh, it, it's very simple. It's standard. There's a nice uh, piano background um, atmosphere behind it. Um, it. You know what? It reminded me of Empire of the Clouds without actually going anywhere. So there didn't seem to be a destination on the song. Um, it wasn't playful, which m- meant that when you're surrounded with so many tracks that are, 
that have got so many components and changes and mood changes. So it just fe- it, for me, it felt very flat. Um, okay. All right, Perrin? I agree. Now, I, I don't think there's any bad songs on this album, but I would say this is the weakest song on the album. Like the, I, the lowest rating I gave on the album is a six on 10 for a song, and this is my six on 10. So it, it gets a passing grade, I suppose. And Tanvir described it really well. Most ballads, there's beautiful instrumentation as there is in this song, and it kind of starts slow and it builds to this Mm -hmm. apex. And then the money shot is that apex. And then it brings you back down gently. This is more just this flat line right through the song where it, it doesn't go anywhere. There isn't that payoff. There isn't that moment where it just brings you up and soars and then brings you back down. That's that's what I feel most ballads attempt to do, and, and very often they do do. Uh, yeah, this one, I agree that it just doesn't go anywhere. It's a little too flat for me. If the album, I mean, the album's 60 minutes, it's not too long, but if this had been cut from the album and we had like a 53-minute album minus the song, I would have been perfectly satisfied. Yeah, to me, I agree with everything Perrin said. Yep. It's like it had it has a nice sort of momentum, but then it kind of falls flat on the chorus. I think it could have been something else there. Go ahead. What he wanted was the rest of the album is so creative and so adventurous that this is, I think, his attempt to just have a simple sing along type song. Like, for, for I don't like the song, but for all that I don't like about it, it is catchy. It still does stick in your in your head, the, the fact that he sings this song. And it is a sad song. Uh, apparently, he wrote it about alcoholism and getting older. Um, I love Bruce's ballads. He's written loads of beautiful uh, sad songs as well. Man of Sorrows, The Tears of the Dragon, uh, No Way Out is a really good sad song. Um, but I feel like, considering he's made a career on writing beautiful songs, this one doesn't do anything for me at all. all right. And I feel like it's, it's kind of lazy. All right, guys, next song, Shadow of the Gods. I don't know. To me, this is this is grandose. Tanvir, what would you think? I love the um, th- these two actually. The older songs. Apparently, this song was written about 20, 20 years ago. Um, so it's an epic, seven minutes long. It has a um, Bruce sounds fantastic in this song. I mean, the, as I say, I, I mentioned his enunciation. You can hear every single word he sings. You hear it clearly that, um, and you'd be surprised in terms of how many singers you listen to, and you don't actually know what they're saying. So, um, you know, all credit to him on that front. Um, the best thing about the song is that it has this sort of cutting riff in the middle of the song uh, that sort of converts into this powerful chug, and then you have this ascending guitar outro. So. Uh, once again, not one of the stronger tracks for me on the album, one of the weaker ones. Wow. Um, I did like the outro at the end. Um, but solid, solid, but um, fairly unremarkable, though not as unremarkable as, you know, Face in the Mirror. Uh, you know, a solid track. All right, my parent. Look, I, I think this is what Face in the Mirror should have been. It, it, you mm. know, I don't know if I would quite call this a ballad. I might call it more of an epic than a ballad. Uh, but I mean, there are slow parts. I love the melancholy opening. I would call this song cinematic. I find this song is very cinematic. I love the, or- I find the orchestration almost like Michael Kamen like in the song. Like it's just, uh, and that's not Kamen, that's Michael Kamen. Mm. Like it really, I, I, I this, this is kind of like a soundtrack song for me in like a big, epic movie that you're watching in IMAX all around you. Like, so I I found it musical. I find it cinematic. I agree about the nice kind of heavy riff about halfway, two thirds of the way through and it ends in a very grand way. So this is the kind of thing I, I, I expect from Bruce. This is Bruce again, take me on this journey, lift me up, give me highs and lows throughout the song. That's what this does. So yeah. this one is is in my top half of the album in terms of ranking the songs. I, I like this one quite. Yeah. What do you think of this song? I think, uh, just to go back to what Tanvir said, like this song was written at 
uh, as part of the Three Tremors project that didn't happen with Hal Ford and Jeff Tate. And he wrote it at the same time as Tyranny of Souls. And I think this song is like a sister to Eternity of Souls. If you compare the two songs, they're very similar in, in their progression. They're very similar in their scope. And they're t- like, it's cinematic, it's dramatic. It's got that chugging, cutting riff that, in the middle that Tanvir spoke about, almost exactly the same. And I think that's probably why Bruce didn't use it for, uh, for Eternity of Souls or, uh, or until now because it's been kept because the songs are so similar. There's some nice callbacks to like Chemical Wedding and it really has that that majestic feel. Uh, he's telling a big story in a big way with this song, but it just, I think because of where it is on the album and after, after Facing the Mirror, which is a sad song, this also has a kind of sad feel to it. So it slows the album right, right down and I wish that it just had something different. This is, it's just a bit too close to Tiny Souls and not as good. And if it was maybe earlier in the album or or there was something else to it, it's missing something for me. And I, right. I can't, I don't have, I enjoy it. It's a beautiful song, but it just, it's just missing something. Sonata, I mean, another slow song jimmy this yes. this is this is their pink floyd song yes, that's what i felt i listened to this and i felt this was i'm sorry perrin you might want to switch off now but we're going to talk about a bit of floyd um i thought yeah i thought this was their pink floyd song actually the intro reminded me of um had the same slow tone of um roger waters's deja vu from his last album and the outro was almost Gilmore-esque. It was almost like comfortably numb in terms of there is this beautiful outro um, two minutes from the end, which is um, sort of harked back, the tone harks back to, you know, Gilmore's second solo on comfortably numb. Um, the, The one thing I would say about Bruce is this, and it's a tiny flaw. I mean, I'm really sort of, um, being very slight here, and and there's a line in this that says, "Save me now, save me now, save me now, help me, help me live again." It's very touching, but I d- I don't buy into it because Bruce still sounds he doesn't sound vulnerable. He still sounds very powerful. He sounds too strong, even when he's singing the mid paced songs. They're so powerful that you don't buy into the vulnerability. Whereas if you had someone like a fish or a Peter Gabriel singing that, it would have been a more poignant. And I think that, I mean, it's a small point. And it's, I, I, I just say, Bruce is a brilliant I, I, heavy I, metal I, I, singer. I, I, I think Save Me Now, Save Me Now, he's crying out for help. And he is vulnerable. And I think that's he, just he a is, great Jimmy, way to but end I the don't, album. But th- I'm saying it's a, a little point. It's what he's tone. saying, yeah, I mean, that's fine. But what I'm saying is it would have been even more effective if you could hear more fragility more a vulnerability in his voice and right. you don't really you don't hear that as i say it's a small point he's a heavy metal singer in a heavy metal band and i think a hogarth or a fish or a peter gabriel would have elevated that even more because i really think this is a a um this has the makings of being a really epic prog track all right, um, all right. And, we'll, and, we'll leave it there, will it, Perrin? You want to weigh in? If I have any issue with the record, is I find it ends on a kind of a dull note with the last three songs. And again, not that they're bad songs, but they're all kind of slower, melancholy. The word I, I used to describe this song was eerie. It had kind of an eerie vibe to it, an eerie production, different from the rest of the record. Again, it's interesting. Uh, and it even opens with kind of almost a little bit of a techno beat, you know? So there, it's, it's again, the thing I like about this record is it challenges the listener. It's not an easy listen. Uh, not one of my favorite songs. I would have liked to see the album end on a more powerful note, the, the banger. Uh, and maybe it's just the placement of the songs, I don't know. So, yeah, a little, a little lackluster for me, but interesting because it's an eerie song. Oh, you know what? Before we get to K-Man's comment, I'm going to say... 
and I said this before, we are all accustomed to cookie cutter metal songs, cookie cutter metal albums. Like it's got to start like this. It's got to end like this. It's got to have a mid. And as soon as somebody does something different, like Bruce has three slow tracks at the end, everybody's like, what the hell's going on? It's so boring and this and that. I'm not saying you guys are saying that. I'm just saying that the overall perception is. How I'm dare saying you that do? a little. You, know, you are saying that a little, I guess. I, I I'm not but, saying that. But, I want to. But I, I really but, like this song. I just. And, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna I'm say just, to you, I'm gonna say to Perrin's point, he, he's challenging the listeners with so much information, and so many, so much variety, that we as a, as a sort of a community, we can't process that it's not cookie cutter. This is gonna. This is gonna be a masterpiece in years to come. Okay, man. Tell me your thoughts. I've got a lot to say about this song. Bruce said he came up with these lyrics off the top of his head, and I think that's total misdirection because this song is actually a. It's a continuation of uh, taking the Queen and Midnight Jam. All three songs tell a story, and this is the final chapter of of the story. Uh, if you listen to, if you read the lyrics on Taking the Queen, which I recommend because it's a, a masterpiece fairy tale. And so I think to what Tanvir was saying about not feeling Bruce's human emotion, that probably comes from the fact that he's telling this story. He's, it's not necessarily about him or his life. He is speaking from the point of view of this character who has lost the love of his life, and he's she's been spirited away by evil uh, well, well, I'm happy somebody's paying attention to the lyrics. <laughs> I, I love this song, and uh, I, I feel like it does justice to Taking the Queen. It does justice to Midnight Jam, which I also love. Uh, but the thing about it is that there's one thing that lets this album down is that the, the musicianship, although it's colourful and it's creative and it all blends into Bruce Bruce's ideas for songs. The, there's not many moments where the instrumentation really, really stands out. Like, it's not a riff-driven album. There's not a lot of drum fills. There's not a lot of prominent bass parts. It's, it really is just each song is a vehicle for Bruce to tell whatever story he wants to tell. Hey, man, do you not, do you not think that's deliberate, though? Because I, I, I mean, I pick up on that yeah. point because I think this is a storyteller's album. So I yeah. think Bruce is right at the forefront. And you, the instrumentation, in, instrumentation, I should say, does kick in on the solos when it's meant to. Yeah. It sort of comes in and then it goes afterwards and the focus is back on Bruce. Right, All right guys. As, a, as, a, as a, one, of, one of the greatest... Uh, metal guitarist there is uh, he is playing to Bruce's strengths yes. he's not playing to his own strengths and I think that's all the all the other musicians on the album are, are doing the same as well they are playing what the song requires or, or they're, they're painting up the song and I just feel like it, is, it does challenge metal heads it does challenge this idea that music or especially the, the singer of Iron Maiden should what make a metal album? I love all of Bruce Dickinson's work, but I expected this to be a metal album. I expected it to be a concept album. I expected it to be a a, a continuation, and it is in places like Sonata is is fan service. If you if you pick up on these references, then you 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 get satisfaction, but. He, he does it in a way that that is that challenges convention. Sure. Very well said, guys. Ten seconds each. It's got to end. Ten seconds each. Parent closing remarks. Did you like it? Did you not like it? What'd you think? Ten seconds. Very good to excellent album. I enjoyed it immensely. I'll use the word challenge again. I love that Bruce is going to challenge the listener and to everything that came in and Tander just said. If you're going to be a solo artist outside of your band. This is what you should do. You should stand on your own and you should do something different and you should be the star of your own show. So bravo, well done, Bruce. And I agree this will be an album that we'll be listening to four, five, six years from now and even quick, discovering new things then. Quick rating? Uh, Out of 10? Eight to eight and a half on 10. Tanvir, 10 seconds, then a rating. This is, I think, this is, I, I think this is a very strong album. Uh, 7.5 
probably will be an eight to eight point five in two weeks' time. I I don't think this is a metal album, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think this is a just a great musical adventure. Okay. All right. Gay man, you got the last word. Rating it, rate it, and then you got ten seconds. Then I'm cutting you off. I, I would just say, like, take this album as, as the songs present themselves. You know, don't compare it to Chemical Way. Don't compare it to Turn Their Souls. Don't compare it to Accident at Birth. As as the Magic Project for better and and worse. I, I would say it's a, a strong seven, uh, and he's he's done himself proud. Really. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna let everybody go with this. I already gave my rating. It's like a nine out of ten. I know, but I've listened to it for a lot longer than all of you have, and I've absorbed it. And I just think this will be one of Bruce's best solo albums in years to come. People will go back to this and say, you know what, that was one of his best solo albums because of the diversity, the variety, and just so many influences that you can hear in it, and little nuances in his voice, and the music, and the guitar, drums and so on. Guys, thank you very much. Pick up The Mandrake Project. It's out. <laughs>